All right, Alexander, let's talk about the palace intrigue in Kiev. Perhaps the, the longest firing process I have ever seen, but it finally happened. Uh, uh, Zaluzhny's finally been fired, and Sirsky is the guy. So why Sirsky? Why did Zelensky go with Sirsky? Do you believe that the United States wanted someone else? Perhaps Budanov. Do you believe that uh, the European Union is happy with uh, with Zaluzhny being gone and having Sirsky in as the overall commander? Is the UK happy with uh, this shakeup and having Sirsky be commander? Uh, my overall impression, very quickly, is that uh, Zelensky chose the the person who is the least threat to himself. Budanov would have been a huge threat. I believe the U.S. wanted Budanov. I believe the CIA wanted Budanov. And I really do believe that, that Zelensky, my hunch is that Zelensky made this choice, that he wasn't influenced by anybody else. That's, that's my hunch. I could be completely wrong. But I think Zelensky said, you know, if Budanov uh, is the guy and if we go the CIA U.S. route, I'm in deep trouble. Uh, a lot of support for Zeluzhny. I need to pick someone who doesn't have that type of support and who's not going to be a threat to me. And I think he went with Siski. And yeah, Siski's not a very popular guy, by the way, not a very popular commander. But anyway, you can get into that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Why do you I mean, think uh, all of this happened? I think you're basically right. I mean, I, I think all the indications were that were piling up over the last couple of weeks that the consensus was we want the Danish in. We see the conventional war in Ukraine is, is ending. We want to move towards an insurgency war. This is the plan. Budanov is the person to organize it. He's reliable. He's somebody who works very closely with the British, especially. And, um, you know, everybody understands uh, that Zeluzhny is, has lost it. By the way, I, I, I'd like to say a few things about Zeluzhny in a moment. But um, I think that... Everybody could see that Zeluzhny really isn't, wasn't capable of turning the thing round and that a conventional war is really not an option any longer. So they all wanted Budanov. But Zelensky himself, very nervous about having someone like Budanov there. I suspect many people in the military not at all happy about being commanded by someone who has no background in command. So, with Budanov being sidelined, that only left Sirsky because Sirsky is the only person who could, in any logical sense, fill this place. And of course, the thing about Sirsky is that if you look at the comments that have been all over the place, the economists today, every one of them, no one likes him. He is not liked by the soldiers, he's not liked apparently by the other generals, he's not liked by the nationalist hardliners, he's not liked by the British, he's not liked by the Americans, even Julian Röpke, the a journalist at Bild Zeitung, doesn't like him. They all say he's a terrible commander, he uh, uh, loses hundreds of thousands of men in battles, his uh, uh, um, whole record is of a string of defeats, <laughs> Why appoint someone like this? Well, you're absolutely right. He's no conceivable threat to um, Zelensky. Um, he's the last person to be able to organise a coup. It's not as if the Ukrainian, other Ukrainian generals would be happy to follow his lead. So he's safe for Zelensky. He's more safe than Zeluzhny was. He's more safe than Budanov was because he's, Zelensky's position is a weak one relative to the other parts of the military in Ukraine, that will make him more dependent on Zelensky, and therefore he can carry out more loyally Zelensky's orders. So clearly there's been an enormous, protracted, bitter battle fought out in Kiev. We can only guess at some of the permutations of it. Zeluzhny clearly didn't want to go and resisted his sacking. Um, Budanov did it. One moment he wanted it, another moment he didn't. 
There's a lot going on behind the scenes. But ultimately, one senses that Zelensky got the general he wanted. Yeah, and, and I also imagine the conventional war is to the benefit of Zelensky as well. He, he can now put out narratives of 2025 counteroffensive, once again, to, to split uh, the Russian force if Sea of, of Azov. We need more weapons. We need more money. So I think even the narrative of a conventional war instead of an insurgency war for Zelensky benefits him. Well, of course he does, because he has no role in an insurgency. <laughs> I mean, he, he, would, he would have to go into exile. Uh, I mean, he'd probably go off to Florida or someplace like that. And difficult situation. But if there was an insurgency, the person who was running the insurgency, who would presumably be Badanov, would be the one who would become the star. <laughs> Whereas um, with a conventional war, it, Zelensky still has a role. He's still the president. He's still able to, um, you know, appear and give the interviews, and travel around the world. And, of course, he's got a notoriously aggressive officer who believes in attack all the time, uh, which is Sirsky. And all his attacks, of course, have been debacles, starting, by the way, from the Battle of Debalsova, in 2015, which many, many people say it was Sirsky who was basically responsible for. But anyway, um, he's got a very aggressive commander, somebody who's prepared to talk about offensives, somebody who's apparently prepared to defend Avdeevka to the last man, which looks like a hopeless case. But he's got that kind of general, a general who will follow his orders and a general who's loyal to him. Now, there's actually on that, by the way, an interesting revelation, and it came in the Daily Telegraph, and it said that way back in 2022, uh, Zeluzny had been strongly opposed to Ukraine's Kharkiv offensive. He saw it as a diversion. This is from the Daily Telegraph, not from, you know, telegram sources. So this is almost certainly real. He, uh, uh, he thought, Zeluzny did, that the Kharkiv offensive only only resulted in cosmetic achievements. Again, that's the Daily Telegraph's words. And was not worth the cost to Ukraine. And that the whole thing was Sirsky's idea. And that tells us a lot about the dynamic between the two men. Because Sirsky and Zelushny also didn't get on. But Sirsky gave Zelensky against Zeluzhny's wishes, a big PR victory. Because ultimately, that is what the Kharkiv Offensive was. Zeluzhny, by contrast, has never given Zelensky any sort of PR victory. And that is one of the reasons why there is this enormous tension between the two men and why instinctively Zelensky prefers Z uh, Sirsky over Zeluzhny. So what happens to Zeluzhny now? There are rumors that he could be ambassador to the UK. I thought Reznikov was already going to be ambassador to the UK. Everyone gets exiled to the UK, I guess, to be ambassador. But um, what, what happens to uh, Zeluzhny? Poroshenko, Zeluzhny, Klitschko, they seem to be an item, these, these three. Oh, yeah, and, and Poroshenko actually came out to the defense of, of Zeluzhny the other day in the parliament. So, so where does Zeluzhny go? Does he... Does he take his money and run and disappear and just say, okay, I'm out? Now I can live the good life somewhere in Italy or, or France or, or the United States? Or does Zeluzhny hang around in Ukraine, hang around in Kiev, uh, team up with Poroshenko, with Klitschko, and um, perhaps make a play at, at, uh, at power? What, what happens to, to the it is, it's a It is a very, very interesting question about what Zeluzhny is going to do. Now, I think the thing to understand about Zeluzhny is that putting aside the question of how good a military commander he is, and um, I'm, I'm not going to get into that in this program, but I understand this growing doubts about this. this incre I mean, again, the Daily Telegraph straightforwardly said that he was a clown. <laughs> I mean, that was how they described Zeluzhny, that apparently he likes to clown around and that there, are, that there are people who think he isn't serious enough for his job. He's also a relatively Well, they might be officer. scapegoating him. 
Yeah, well, they might be. But, I mean, he's a relatively yeah. young officer. He's about 50, um, which, you know, is young for a general to run a war as complex as this. And he was promoted over the heads of a lot more, a lot of other generals who were more experienced than himself, including, by the way, Sierski. But Zaluzhny has two advantages, and they are essentially political advantages. One is that he is Ukrainian. I mean, he is a Ukrainian born in Ukraine, and that makes him much more acceptable to the nationalists. Others, like Sirsky, Sirsky is Russian. He was born in Russia, in the town of Vladimir, which is in central Russia. His parents are still alive, and they're still there. They are supporters of President Putin, as it turns out. And he has a brother who is still in Russia, who won't talk to him, because, uh, you know, this is, they feel completely differently about things than Sirsky does. So Sirsky is a Russian. And that automatically is going to make him suspect to the Ukrainian nationalists, who are such a powerful force in, within Ukrainian society. The other thing about Sirsky and most of the other top generals in Ukraine is that they are Soviet products of the Soviet military system. They train through the Soviet Union. I mean, um, Sirsky trained at the Moscow Higher Command School. And he was an artillery officer in the Soviet army. He served briefly in Afghanistan and in other places. Um, he is a product, as I said, of the Soviet military system. Zaluzhny is not. He received all his military training in Ukraine. His entire military um, background is in Ukraine. To the extent that he's received any training, foreign training at all, it would have come from the Americans. So that already tells you that Zaluzhny is going to be popular with some people because they see him as an authentic Ukrainian general, uncontaminated by Russia, uncontaminated by the Soviet, uh, uh, by the Soviet system. And uh, remember, you know, Siski was an officer in the Soviet armed forces he would presumably at one point have been a member of the Soviet Communist Party because, you know, that was, if you were an officer in the Soviet Union, that was basically what you had to be. So Zaluzhny is free of all of that. He's gone out of his way to associate himself with the hardline nationalists. He has had pictures of Bandera in his office. He's appeared in photos recently with... Uh, uh, top people within right sector, one of the very hardline nationalist organizations. And of course, Poroshenko and Klitschko, who you mentioned, are both veterans of the Maidan movement. They were there when uh, um, you know, the Maidan events took place in 2013, 2014, and when there was the change of power in 2014. Zelensky is not... So you can see a situation where Zaluzhny, you know, the Ukrainian general connected to Ukrainian nationalists, allied to people like Poroshenko and Klitschko, could, if he chose, form a kind of nationalist military opposition to Zelensky. And Zelensky, who is not an ethnic Ukrainian, as we know, has now a commanding general who is also not an ethnic Ukrainian. He's actually a Russian. And you could put all this together, and if things start to go wrong on the battlefronts, you can just imagine how Zaluzhny and Poroshenko and Klitschko, if they decided to work together, could form a very, very powerful opposition to Zelensky indeed, drawing on all the old Maidan forces in Kiev and seeking the support of all the various nationalist militias. And already there's been calls, by the way, for a new Maidan. So just saying, so that, it, it, you know, it, it is a potential thing that Zaluzhny could do. But of course, it's his choice 
And does he go to London and, you know, get the cushy job of ambassador there, in which case he basically drops out of Ukrainian politics? Or does he stay in Kiev, participate in the political conflicts that are taking place there, involve himself in the political struggles and palace intrigues, and hope to wait, find a way back with Poroshenko and potentially Klitschko and uh, establish some new kind of hardline nationalist government, um, you, you know, self-identifying as straightforwardly Ukrainian and committing itself to the struggle against, um, against, uh, against Russia. So it's potential. It's, it's potential interesting situation. Kind of nonsense that Solution would be ambassador to London, isn't it? I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. It really is. Um, well, it's a sign. You didn't mention Timoshenko way... either. Well, yeah. Timosh Tim Timoshenko is also there circling. And bear in mind that Poroshenko and Timoshenko hate each other. And um, Timoshenko is a very interesting political politician, very astute and cunning politician, utterly unprincipled and deeply corrupt but nonetheless extremely cunning. And uh, she seems to be positioning himself, herself in a different way. Um, she's not exactly saying this, but she's dropping the hints that if things go the other way and you want someone in Kiev who might be prepared to open negotiations with the Russians, she would be the person to do that. I mean, her power base has been central Ukraine, not Western Ukraine. She's always had a tricky relationship with the hardline nationalists. So if Zelensky and uh, um, Sirsky fail, um, if and, you know, Klitschko, uh, Poroshenko and Zeluzhny make a move, it's not impossible that all of those other people who think, you know, we've got to find another kind of way out, that this hardline nationalist movement which is, to be clear, only a minority in Ukraine, um, is leading the country to disaster and will take us to an even further disaster. It's not inconceivable that they might coalesce behind Dimashenko. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I, I feel that um, Zelensky was really left with, with a bad option and a terrible option when all of this uh, started to... to to surface up, to bubble up. Uh, Budanov would have meant that Zelensky would have been removed e eventually. And, um, and Siski, well, you explained how that, how that weakens Zelensky's position at the end of the day. Uh, without the Europeans, at this point in time, without the Europeans, Ursula, Borrell, Macron, Schultz, Baerbach, Zelensky really has no more support. Sunak, I think Sunak does have a liking for Zelensky as well. We know that Boris has some sort of thing with Zelensky. But, um, you know, it, you do get the impression that the Americans, they wanted Budanov. They're done with Zelensky. And Zelensky seems to have caught wind of uh, of the fact that, that the Blinkens, the Newlands, the Sullivans... Uh, they don't re really want Zelensky in power anymore. Probably the Grahams and the McConnells as well. They feel like he has failed the neocons. And uh, th that's why he ultimately told Budanov no and, and went with Sirsky. But it's that EU support, this type of bond that he has with, with these EU officials that really is keeping him afloat. But he, but he really didn't have a good option in any of this, whether it was Budanov, Sirsky. E either path that he, was to that he was going to take is eventually just going to lead to to his ousting one way or another. That, that's, how, that's how it seems to me. I agree. I mean, I, I think that this um, replacement of Zeluzhny with Sirsky is, is, to be straightforward about it, it's an act of desperation. I mean, the military situation is becoming increasingly difficult. He, Zelensky seems to have lost the confidence of the Americans, or at least the dominant faction in the United States. Um, and um, you're quite right. The Europeans built up Zelensky to a ludicrous degree. So did the British even more, by the way. And um, they are his last real constituency. It's the only real constituency he had left. If he'd left Zeluzhny in post, and we've discussed this in various programmes, if he'd left Zeluzhny in post, then he would have become essentially president in name only and would have had to step down 
and his fate thereafter would have been an uncertain one. And I think we need to say that. Um, so what he's done is he's bought himself a little more time by getting a, a general in place who is not Budanov, who might have been, who would have been a potential danger to him. And um, got a general who may be deeply unpopular and deeply uh, um, incompetent, but who for that for those precise reasons is not a danger to him. It's the kind of thing you start to see when regimes start to disintegrate. Um, Poroshenko made this extraordinary speech in the Ukrainian parliament in which he was openly calling for Zelensky to step down. And um, I, I said in the video I do on my own channel that it reminded me of Pavel Milyukov's speech in the Imperial State Duma in, 19, in November 1916, uh, criticising the Tsar and basically saying that the Tsar wasn't running the war effectively, which, to be straightforward about it, was a precursor of the sequence of events which eventually led to the Tsar's abdication. And again, if you go back to that time, 1916, in Russia, there was again lots of appointments and people being brought in essentially to buy time to try to stabilise the situation. And of course, none of that in the end succeeded because all the, you know, the motion, the movements to force the abdication were in place. And to be frank, this appointment looks like that. It's another desperate attempt by a drowning man to buy himself time, hoping that something will turn up and, um, you know, um, looking for someone who he can rely upon. Yeah, well, Duda did say that Ukraine was was drowning and it's going to pull everyone down with it. So anyway, all right, uh, thedoran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitshoot, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X and go to the Duran shop. 15% off all T-shirts. Take care.